And they know it's winter time, you know? It's, they, they know that. That's where I'm trying to bridge with their other information that they have. With it. And say, are, are we really that much closer to the sun than Australia is? <clears throat> and then you point out to them that we have an elliptical orbit around the sun. Most of the pictures are, are bad with this. But actually, in January, we're only 147 million kilometers away. <clears throat> in July, we're 152 million kilometers. We're much farther away in July. But even that difference, when we use the inverse square root law, which is the, you know, the heat decreases with the, the square, basically, of the distance with it, that can only account for a difference of 5 degrees Celsius. And, of course, you've got to then convince people what convert what Celsius means to, which is always a challenge. Um, do some things like this, some drawings, and so, okay, here we're at the equator, we have basically the sun shining coming down here, we can look at some things about the concentration, with it. we go a little bit farther north or south, okay, the rays are not perpendicular anymore, they're spread out over a larger area, in this sense they're spread out over one unit, same amount of light energy here spread out over 1.4 units versus 2 units, and trying to build these types of things up, build this information up, that they would have to use then. <coughs> Maybe even show them another picture basically does the same thing. <coughs> These pictures though sometimes can be dangerous because one of the things this picture does is besides showing about how much this, this sun's rays are spread out, it also emphasizes this difference in the atmosphere that it goes through. <coughs> so they're showing that in the at the, the northern hemisphere and the north up here is going through a lot more atmosphere, which does attenuate the, the energy somewhat, but not nearly enough to count for our differences in our seasons. So even to, I mean, pictures and textbooks then sometimes bring these misconceptions, continue with it. So we could then ask the question again about it, and this would be another great place then to do a comparative slide with it and I don't care if you guys answer this or not. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. So. <clears throat> but it is the concentrations of the sun's rays. You guys did it. You did good. You did it good. Okay. The types of misconceptions and things that I've talked about now, there's a no, there, and there, you can categorize them all sorts of different ways. Different authors will categorize them in different ways. This is one that I sort of like. There's these factual, factual and vernacular misconceptions, like the ones that I had about the river, the lateral movement. So a student has to know what lateral is versus downward. You might think it's simple, but it's, they still get it. You've got to know whether they're talking about what a meander is in that case. So, and those usually seem to be a little bit easier to change. These other things, though, about these concepts, and thinking about the raindrops, for example, this drop falling through water, we have this concept of, of the friction on the outside curving, the, moving this water back up around. That's a concept that we have that, that can be difficult to change. And when I deal with evolution and geology of the fossils and things, students will come to class thinking that the Earth is 5,000 years old. That, that, that is another, then, tough thing to deal with. And then there's other pictures and stuff. My hypothesis from my experiment here that I was doing is this, is that the student response system will allow me to identify and confront these misconceptions. I will then use then these discussions here to talk about it and to describe what's happening and describe the data and try to get the students, in a sense, then to rebuild their knowledge with it. Specific predictions were that um, the misconceptions that just with the student response system will um, have a higher normalized gain, in other words, they're going to learn more, than the ones that I didn't use the student response system with it. And I still use an active learning technology with it. I use discussion questions and use concept maps and other things with it. Um, and also that the factual misconceptions would be easier to change than the conceptual ones. Nothing brand new, exciting there, basically the same, same things as what you, if you looked in the, the literature, what you would find. I was able to find a geosciences concept inventory of about 55, 60 questions that had been tested here, well, 43 courses with over 2,500 students, so they were able to pull out these sexually biased questions, 
questions that were, you know, students were getting wrong for the wrong reasons, basically, um, with them. And so they ended up with about 45 questions. I went through that list and pulled out 25 that I deal with, 24 of them actually, that I deal with in my class. And a fifth one, that a 25th one that I don't deal with in my class, just to sort of see what was happening. What Julie and Stephen found in their research um, was that these things, these ideas, these misconceptions are really difficult to remove, what, no matter what type of pedagogy you're using. And that the students then that came in sort of knowing the least actually tended to make the most gains. So that, that was interesting to me. So I have, um, here's an example of a vernacular factual question I'm going to skip over. But then I would use, I'd use a lot of times the pictures coming up then afterwards that they would, they would show it. <coughs> what I did, I took these questions and I randomly picked 12 of them that I'm going to address with the student response system. And I did this for two years in these two classes. And I, what I want to do is show you some questions here about what were from the geos, geosciences concept inventory and what were the ones I used in the class. Geoscience concept inventory questions were given at the beginning of the semester and then at the end of the semester, so I could see the change. I could not use those same questions. They're just going to learn those questions. Okay, so I had to be careful. So I really am trying to bias this in the sense of having it deal with the same topic, the same concept, but not the same question. In fact, not even worded exactly the same way. So here's a question from the uh, geosciences concept inventory. Where are most rocks formed? Well, <clears throat> the answer is most rocks are formed at the surface. Okay. My discussion question of this, what I would give them in class and we would talk about and do, is, is something like this. That there's more igneous rock in the crust of the earth than sedimentary rock, but we see more sedimentary rock. Explain. And we would then talk about where igneous rocks formed and metamorphic rocks and where, you know, all of the rocks, basically almost all of them are formed except metamorphic rock, very close to the surface. <clears throat> and so they would be getting this information. So this is the, this is the non-student response system, what I would deal with in class. Here's a geoscience uh, concept inventory uh, question asking them where uh, the... Um, basically the edges of plates are in the sense for the plate tectonics theory. Um, but they're looking at where do you usually find volcanoes. And so they would, they, would, they would pick one of these. And the right answer is that they're mostly along the margins of the Pacific Ocean in this case, which is called the, the Ring of Fire. Now what I would do though in class is to give them a student response question like this. That first one was about volcanoes. This one's not about volcanoes. This one's asking about geological activity in general and which ones are going to be outlined. So it's the same concept. Where do you see stuff happening on Earth? Where do you see earthquakes? Where do you see volcanoes? Okay. Where do you see these um, mountain buildings and things like that? And <clears throat> So we're getting at the same concept, because I want to convince you that I'm not just teaching here to these questions on it. I mean, I actually tried to make it hard on myself so that it would be the concept that the students would, would come across with. <clears throat> Here's one about glaciers. And where do you think glaciers would be found today in the geoscience concept inventory? The student response system would be something like this. Glaciers are found here. And the answers aren't even the same ones as that we had before. The answers before were, you know, on the mountains here, on, you know, at, at some at sea level and some things like that. So we've got some of the same answers, but did not. And, and you can see the students, when they did this, did actually did very well on this question. I also would sometimes do some things and put a question similar to it on a test as we were going along. I wanted to see how they were doing. I haven't analyzed the test data yet because I don't have that many of them. Okay. <clears throat> what I found out couple good things. One thing that when I compared the class from 2005 to 2006, there was no significant difference. That means I can just, I can deal with them both the same way. I don't have to worry about some things. I still sort of kept them separate. I could have combined them with this. The other good thing is, as a teacher, they did better on the post-test than they did on the pre-test. 
they learn something in my class. It, makes you, it really makes you feel good when they really do learn something in your class here.